Welcome everyone to Mail Fuzz TV. I am Peter, that is Tara, and we are going to talk about Star Trek Strange New Worlds Season 1 Episode 5. It is called Spock Amok. <laughs> I feel like I'm stressed that weird bit. I feel like it should rhyme. Because it's <laughs> Spock Amok. <laughs> but anyway, Spock Amok. There you go. Uh, so, yes, full spoilers for the episode, as always. Um, and it does have some heavy referencing to uh, Amok Time and the, the opening. The opening dream mm-hmm. sequence, which also takes a lot, I feel, from uh, a fantastic sequence from Superman 3, in which evil Superman and Clark Kent fight in a junkyard. Mm-hmm. Because the premise of this dream sequence that Spock has is that human Spock fights Vulcan Spock in his head. Right. Can... Two worlds are at odds. Yes, he's split in <laughs> two and he's fighting himself, which is yeah, it's a very on the nose way of looking at but you know, you get the metaphor, it works. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh but uh d- complete with the dan 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 music. Yeah. Uh, Even the way to bring is acting is very original series, which goes him <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, what's funny actually is i i was looking about after i watched the episode and i was reminded that the first time i ever heard that music was actually in the cable guy because there's yeah. a scene where jim carrey sings I, it yeah i always want to do the because <laughs> <laughs> uh, i saw that you know years before i actually watched the original series of star trek so uh, yeah well but... obviously it was the reverse for me but i still enjoy it just as much it was a very distinct piece of music that they were mm-hmm. using there so it was hard not to get the reference uh but this is a this is a, a quiet light-hearted episode that is uh basically a shore leave for the crew where they're the doctor st- basically the actually this is a nice follow-up because obviously the original show did have like quieter episodes like this where they, there's literally one called shore leave but they never actually followed on because the previous episode meant the ship had like you know we never had a big episode where clearly the ship needs to go get repaired because they were just in like these huge battles it mm-hmm. would never follow up next episode it would be like oh you know a lot of time has passed or something because they just don't mention what just happened whereas here it's like oh no no that the ship got damaged heavily in the last episode so this is why they're at a, a station get in as well we're on shore leave because we can't really do anything else so yep uh, it makes sense space station one which is in our solar system I like that the, uh, I don't know if this has always been the case or not, but the domes are kind of like the um, what, the silent running domes on their mm. station, where it's just these ecosystems. There was some like that, uh, I want to say Discovery had a station that had domes like that on it. Yeah, I I, I think it was also brought up in the in the pilot episode for this show too, where oh, we yeah, saw possibly. it, and I meant to bring it up before, and I didn't, uh, I, I, I forgot to. There's a lot to talk about though. Yeah. Oh, it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, and it makes sense the space station one or whatever is like, and close to Earth. <laughs> like it mm-hmm. just makes sense. Uh, so yeah, they're in getting patched up, and we get a variety of plots, um, including the Freaky Friday style body swap plot mm-hmm. with Spock and Tepring, uh, his his wife to be. So we'll get into that, which was, I was all about d- dubious getting into that plot as it was starting, because, you know, probably my least favorite thing about the first episode was the, uh, the little bit of, you know, them on Vulcan, like him having <laughs> to leave her behind. That's probably my least favorite thing. Uh, so I, I think well, what- I, I do like that they, they're giving her some character, you know? Oh, sure. Kind of like Nurse Chapel, who was, you know, if she basically had one thing, she wanted Spock in the original series. And now they actually have a character being built around her. Which sort of clashes with what, you know, her personality in the original series, but that's okay. Like, we want these characters to be interesting and fleshed out. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point you have to accept that there's going to be all these little tweaks. Because it, mm-hmm. it kind of feels like to me that because the original show was made in the 60s, as progressive as it was for its time, there's lots of things that, you know, still don't hold up by today's standards. That you know, So it's, it's kind of... It's this weird thing where you sort of look at look at the original show and say, well, Kirk's adventures, Kirk and the crew, all those adventures still happened, but there's all these little tweaks that are being done to it. So it's like, it happened, but with some slight changes. Like, I think in the original show, for example, like, I want to say there was a rule that a woman couldn't be a captain in the original show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously they've already, they've already, like, retconned that because Discovery's had, like, multiple women captains at this point. Yeah, for good reason. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's just those little fixies like that and there's just a little tidbits and I think the character stuff you can kind of go with as well. Um, 
so yeah so we get this body swap thing where spock promises because he, she's visiting the ship uh and she critiques his quarters and it's all very it's like because they're both vulcan it, they feel very passive aggressive all the time like, all the time yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what she's talking about lower decks actually has a couple good episodes that d- displace this even more where <laughs> you can feel tension even though um all they're doing is just doing this passive aggressive thing which is also something I do with my mother, so maybe that's why I feel the tension. <laughs> now, because she's walking around, she's saying, oh, this, this quarters is so human. I can't imagine a Vulcan would live here. And Spock says <laughs> something to the effect of, oh, it's a work in progress. I'm still decorating. And she's like, then I would hold my criticism until you finish your decoration. <laughs> so implying that she's going to critique it again <laughs> when he's done. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, because this is a follow-up to, or, I mean, it's right after when we see what Spock's subconscious is telling him, which mm. is that he's not Vulcan enough for her. Yeah. So yeah. like this whole, like criticizing his human part is <laughs> his human side. I should say, as soon as he, she walks in, and you know, it's, that's something yeah, that's like, a little deflating, you know, really put into light later on in the episode is this idea that part of the reason why he likes being in Starfleet is because he's not like, he's just Spock and they see him as like, more of a Vulcan than if I mean he, he says that he can just be Spock and he's not really Chris he's not looked at differently uh I would suggest that maybe he is to an extent but in the sense that they just see him as Vulcan because he's different whereas mm-hmm. on Vulcan he was always teased and like a- any as he, as he puts it, any deviation from pure Vulcan was seen as a, a reason to say well he's not he's not a proper Vulcan because he's half human so he's just he's just proving it because he's not so it's like he has to be extra it's kind of like Worf and uh, next gen actually he has to like Obviously, he's fully Klingon, but he's raised by human parents, so he it's like he really over compensates by like, no, I'm going to go fill into all the Klingon yeah. like rituals and ideals. It's going to be stuff. extra, yeah. So, uh, no, I like that about this about this. I mean, we we sort of can glean that from other Sp- versions of Spock that we've mm. seen anyway. But the the fact that he's always been trying, he grew up having to be ashamed, but also defend his human side, and now on the ship he doesn't have to worry about that and he he sort of has to you know defend his vulcan side but mostly just to other vulcans and to humans is just you know in in good fun ah yeah i mean obviously when bones comes aboard he's gonna have a harsh time because bones uh, gives him shit for it constantly but (laughs) but it's probably still nice for him to be seen as a vulcan when growing up he wasn't yeah because to all the humans he's more vulcan than he is human because he's just you know because he's got pointy ears if nothing else right just to put it in simplest terms he looks different yeah uh, but to a Vulcan, he's like this bastard child <laughs> kind of thing. I really like this relationship in this episode. I mean, I wasn't crazy about like the watching him about to bone <laughs> in in the first episode, but like, excuse me, Ponfar. <laughs> but it, Ponfar. I mean, in this, I, I thought their chemistry was really good, and I like the Freaky Friday situation. Well, I, I think the only critique I'd have for the body swapping is that it, it, it felt like it happened really suddenly and I wasn't prepared. I didn't feel like they were setting me up for a body swap. It just kind of suddenly happened. Uh, but the reason why it comes to pass is because he promises to be back. He has to go help with some uh, diplomatic things, but he's going to be back for dinner. But then when mm-hmm. the aliens show up, they're like, oh, let's start talks right now. And he's late and she's pissed at him for it. Uh, you know, as, as pissed as a as Vulcan can be without showing too much emotion. <laughs> Extra passive aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> so, after you get some advice from from Chapel, and we'll say I'll, we'll talk about the Chapel scenes a bit, maybe a bit more later when we're talking about Chapel. But uh, you get some advice from uh, Chapel and decides to do this Vulcan ritual of like, oh, well, we'll see how each other feel by actually, you know, fancy mind meld basically, uh, and it ends up swapping the, the, their personality swap, their mind swap bodies. And from, from I think what's interesting the 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 joke that that we get from this is how and they do actually point this out with a uh, Pike once he's told what's going on, but you could barely tell they've swapped because they're because they're both Vulcan and they're both <laughs> acting so like stoic it doesn't really matter <laughs> to a point <laughs> right because <laughs> normally when, when when a movie does this and it, often it'll be like there'll be an age gap between the characters to emphasize it but yeah you'll, you'll have you'll have one character doing an over the top or an actor i should say doing an over the top impression of the other person's performance and vice versa here because right. they're both still just so like yes this is this is very strange this is most unfortunate <laughs> surely but... now that we've mentioned it you can tell by our mannerisms that we are <laughs> swapped it takes like <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, very different. <laughs> <laughs> I actually kind of appreciated that for about 30 seconds, they, they, they're not telling them and they're trying to pretend that they're just who they are. And I do love that the logical thing with Vulcans, Spock just very quick. Once it becomes clear that the, that the aliens only want to talk to Spock, for some reason they've appreciated Spock's candor in their prior talks. And they want to speak to Spock and no one else but Spock. You know, Spock in to Pring's boy just turns and says, we should tell him. It is the most logical, like, way forward. And it is. Like, if Pike knows, then they can accommodate or at least understand why yeah. Why Spock and Luke is not maybe fit to, and look, you know, they could, be, do you these know, talks. There's the Katras and mind melds. It's already borderline magic anyway. So yeah. why not? <laughs> so. why, can't, why can't Vulcans do this? Apparently it's quite rare when it happens, but it's been known to happen before. Yeah, so we get so the idea is they both walk a mile in the other shoes, basically, and she gets a glimpse. Yeah, of, I mean, I think the big theme of this episode is all empathy, right? Yeah. This is what the aliens that are trying to join Starfleet are also about. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not too overt, but you like to get the idea that she probably understands that she's even part of what makes him feel stressful about being half human. Because by the end, mm -hmm. when he's talking about how when he's in Starfleet, he gets to just be Spock. He doesn't have to worry about defending the fact that he's half human. Um, like, I would say that I, I can assume from the context of her understanding him better by the end of the episode that she kind of maybe is aware that that's probably a, a key element of the stress with her <laughs> is the mm -hmm. idea that like his half human side is something he constantly has to. And you know, there's those little things when she first walks in, and like we see, we see him like move two of the glasses before she comes in, and it's the, one of the first things she does when she, when she walks in is move them back to where they were, uh, to just, to just you know, just to show the differences in how they, they think, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, yeah, yeah, and then likewise, Spock has to go and do like part of her day, which is uh, bring in uh like a criminal Vulcan, uh. Vulcans who have lost their way in logic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so Spock in her body has to go meet and goes to chapel and actually tells chapel what's going on by this point. Uh, and they go and have to like, and Spock in her body ends up punching this this Vulcan. Uh, which actually, I actually thought that the, the payoff to this later when he, when he tells her, once they've spot back and he's like, oh, but I should probably tell you that I ended up punching that, uh, that Vulcan. <laughs> and she's like, Having met him, that is most logical. I thought it was a funny <laughs> line. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it's... Um, I did. I, I like the chemistry. I like the... So it's, it's a bit, I think I'm supposed to bring in Chapel here, because I think the first scene where we see her in Ortega's and she's like, oh, yeah, I'm meeting my, like, casual fling that I have that, you know, is always here at the station. Uh, we see her with her, her, her man friend, and basically, as soon as she sees Spock looking a little upset, you know, and clearly, she knows Spock well because it's not like his face changes that much. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was. She was just using them as a scapegoat to get out of this um, awkward situation that she was in that she wasn't expecting. And uh, then, you know, it just so happens that he did need her help. Yeah. But I guess maybe he she did notice that he was upset. I think. Well, I think if nothing else, she saw him sitting there on his own, and he's supposed to be with his fiance. So, so clearly something is not right if he's if he's sitting mm -hmm. in, in in this bar on his own. So she she goes over, and I mean she slaps him as well when he when he explains that he he didn't come home with time for dinner. She she slaps him <laughs> in the head. Um, he looks very confused by this but they have good chemistry and I think what I liked even more than that though was the fact that she has chemistry with Spock and T'Pring's body because mm -hmm. obviously you've obviously got a different actor doing it but they had chemistry when it was them sort of working together um, and you know there's some jokes right. flying which is, around which is an interesting you know little wrinkle in the development of chemistry because it's I mean she's now she's sort of um, at odds with T'Pring but because of her bonding through Spock, through Dupring, uh, yeah, it's a bit complicated. But you know what I mean. Like it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's just it just proves that you know the writing is is well done here because you know if she didn't have chemistry with in the acting because if she didn't have chemistry with her, with Dupring, then she wouldn't have chemistry with Spock in the well, future. Well, I, I think that's what's interesting about it is that. It proves that it's not just, like, a physical thing where she just got the hots for him. Like, her mm -hmm. having chemistry 
with Spock even losing someone else's body is a, actually kind of a flex from a performance perspective to show us that no, she actually has chemistry with Spock, and it's 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 like a real person person personal thing as opposed to right. just oh Spock's got a tight ass Although, and I'm into I mean, it. Yeah, I mean the to Pring's not bad also, <laughs> and she is like by <laughs> according to uh, her and um, the other woman's uh, conversation. It sounds like she had a fling with a with a female somewhere else. Oh yeah, yeah, they mentioned that earlier on. But no, yeah. I, mean, I just, I mean, like it, 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 it kind of. It could just be a hot thing, also. <laughs> but no, I know it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> but that's that's the point I'm making is that this scene, and because they have chemistry when she's sitting explaining, she's cracking jokes with with Spark, even though he's not in his body, it is kind of a flex because it it, it shows. It elevates this this thing, and it makes sense to me that after this experience, this this is this is why it ends in this like sort of like moment with her. Like the final moment of the episode is is Chapel sitting. I think she's with her takers again. Maybe she's with someone mm-hmm. else, but she's sitting, and she has this moment where she sort of thinks, and she's clearly thinking about Spock, and then kind of like ah you know, oh, no no I'm not thinking about anything, and then it cuts on that, and it's but you know exactly what she's thinking about. I get that up until now it's been this flirtation with Spock, and she's kind of like seen something in him, but you know it's whatever it's you know she's able to just sort of ignore it i get that why after this it occurs to her that it's actually stronger than she thought or it's developed into something stronger because she's connected to him even though she was he was in a different body like mm-hmm. it makes sense to me that this is like a natural well escalation. he sort of defended her honor also by like punching out that vulcan for insulting her for being human that's, and that's true. after yeah. she sticks up for him for being you know half human but it makes sense to me that this is a, a, an escalation of the, her feelings, right? Yeah. Even if Spock yeah. never, you know, reciprocates them. Uh, and maybe they'll do something with that. Maybe they won't. Given that it's season one and this might go five seasons, I suspect there'll be at least some contemplation at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, even in the original series, there is... I mean, Nurse Chapel does say that she loves Spock in the original mm. series. So it could be like she just has these feelings that she's never been able to get over because maybe they hooked up i don't know maybe they, maybe yeah. they had a relationship and then like gave up on it or just wasn't working yeah the, the go to the bone zone is happening the pond fire <laughs> oh dear <laughs> i apologize for the use of bone zone everyone but uh i recently i've been playing until dawn and a character says it in that and i thought it was hilarious <laughs> so i'm I'm, I'm going to the bone zone. I'm making it stick. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, no, I, I was surprisingly into most of this plot line. Uh, mm-hmm. I also got a chuckle. Because it was fun. It was a fun episode. Like, it, this oh, was yeah. definitely their comedy episode of the of the season so far. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's, that's definitely All the storylines are fun. Um. It wraps up. Well, it doesn't wrap up. Obviously, we've talked about some stuff that already happens after this, but uh, they solve it medically. It's, they actually get um, Mbenga, who's too just excited about going fishing. He's got like, his fishing hat on. He's excited. Mm-hmm. Uh, Taking a break from his sick daughter and going to go yeah. fishing. But he, they, they bring him back in and they basically rub some gunk on their foreheads and like shock them. <laughs> Pulverized sea urchin. <laughs> <laughs> um. Which, uh, this is, I mean, I don't remember this exact thing necessarily, but I definitely remember visuals from the original series of, like, Spock and someone else lying, like, this, like, sort of, like, head-to-head, like, in opposite directions. That's definitely a visual that I I recognize. Well, there was a body swap episode in the original series, but it was with Kirk and uh, some doctor lady. I, I, I definitely remember, like, they're, they're definitely playing upon visuals of the original show. I mean, they're, mm. they're doing it, obviously, in obvious ways as well elsewhere, but this was, like, a movie, I wouldn't say a subtle one, but more of a, just a specific little thing. Uh, Maybe it was Spock's brain. Yeah, it may have been Spock's brain. <laughs> Maybe it was Spock's brain in there. Brain, brain, brain. What is brain? <laughs> but I did, I did uh, enjoy one day they're going to nerve pinches for this. And he's like, yeah, probably lol. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> <laughs> and then the screaming starts. <laughs> yeah, then crank up the juice. I'm like, oh, this, this is why they're going to nerve pinch you because it's extremely painful. <laughs> well, it's their fault. It's their fault for, like... Exch- you can't exchange Katras on, like... Yeah, that, do you know what that just says? casually. This is this is them. <laughs> this is like having sex without protection. This is they had main meld without protection, and it's led to that's a real thing. Body swap, like shenanigans. Yeah, <laughs> you can't mess around with the mind with the Vulcan mind. Mm-mm. It's a bad idea. Yeah, 
it'll be do fun. You th- do you think uh, the actor uh, Ethan Peck was excited to like do one scene where he didn't have to get the, the ears put on? He's like, oh, I'll just show up in my shirt. <laughs> I mean, there's there's so much makeup in the show and, and like prosthetics. I'm sure he's never allowed to complain about just having the ears. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, like Hammer, who was unfortunately not in this episode. I, I, I was curious yeah. what he was doing to shore leave, but. Uh, like he obviously has to sit in a makeup chair for hours and hours. I'm sure the ears, by comparison, are like a quicker, you know, a nice quick little thing. Yeah. Relative to the you know the full face makeup that lot, some people obviously need to get. Um, but yeah, so no, I, I had a decent time with uh, the, this this plot. And I was mm-hmm. I was pleasantly surprised because I wasn't into the the marriage stuff in the first episode so call, i'll call well, that a, it's win. a pilot episode we're you know it's not very much to judge off of yet they're trying to throw in the sex appeal <laughs> that's well that's what it felt like which i think yeah. is the problem is it just felt kind of hollow in that first episode i think this one and it's been it's done the thing again you know this this was a spock episode obviously some other characters got got some stuff i mean chapel was probably the second character to get stuff and then there was a nice b plot with a couple other characters who get some more time as well yeah uh, probably the most comedy came from that for me yeah, yeah. So the yeah, the, the, the and I mean, it's debatable if the the diplomat things, the B plot, or and the, and then the comedy ones, the C plot. But I, either way, the, yeah, there's like three uh, plots going on here. Yeah. Huh? So, but yeah, we'll mention the fun one first. So we we had uh, Laan and uh, Una. Uh, basically, they're like the grumpy ones who just stay with the ship and they don't they, and they they find out they've got this nickname. Now Laan doesn't really care, but Una's like pissed that they've, they've got a nickname. <laughs> which is where, where fun, fun goes to die where fun goes to die and she's not happy about it and they catch a couple of cadets in a place where they're not supposed to go out and outside into the you know the outside of the ship they're in the hall the the, the airlock and like you don't want to be in here and they grill them out and what's funny is that it's already a little bit amusing because they clearly enjoy some stuff that they do because the, the the moment where they, they both try to shout for bad cop first and like yes that was Lan, hilarious and Lan <laughs> wins it so then we get the montage of them interrogating the two cadets and like Lan's like just being this tough bitch and then Una <laughs> like you can tell she doesn't like doing it but she's like oh I'm your friend I understand it can be challenging being a and cadet and they both get the same information out <laughs> yeah um so both methods work both methods apparently work uh but they find out they're playing enterprise bingo and then once they leave the scene they don't want to like reveal to the cadets that they have no idea what they're talking about but as soon as they leave like what the hell is enterprise bingo (laughs) so something for the lower decks to do yeah yeah, so they found out that it's like a a checklist like a rate of passage where you do all these like and i have to imagine that some of these ideas came from like just like fans over the years coming up with silly things you could do on the ship so one of them is the the idea that if you're, I think it's just gum in this case, but it's like the idea if you got food in your mouth and the flavor goes away, but then you go through the transporter, the flavor will come back because it's been completely remade. <laughs> that was very cool. Yeah. So so they do I that. I didn't look at the checklist. I mean, they they showed the whole checklist, and I I meant to freeze frame and like get a better oh, yeah. look at it. I'm sure there's a screenshot. Yeah. I'm sure there's fun stuff in there. Yeah. Uh, the second ones are in the turbo lift and. They both like it's basically a, a fastest gun kind of thing where they both say where they want to go and then whoever like whatever the lift takes is this is the the order like wins. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lan yeah. wins that one, so <laughs> that's fun. And then they do an actual quick draw thing with phaser guns, uh, which leads yeah, to yeah. I don't know, I don't know exactly if it's supposed to be uh like a duo duel or if it's just we're just going to shoot each other at the lowest, the lowest setting on the phaser. Ah, uh, obviously not set to, to lethal no. for obvious reasons. This is just a silly experiment. <laughs> I I think this uh opens up um, a lot of fun things about what's happening on the ship. What that's you know for, like the lower deck stuff. You know what what they're getting away with because a lot of this stuff is you know you can't fire a phaser on board otherwise um an alarm will trigger. Uh, so like how are they getting away with it? And were they only getting caught now, or like they got caught because they didn't were in the airlock and they obviously didn't clear something first or through somebody else in order to go out there to get this done or do it sneakily. So it just yeah it just opens up a lot of possibilities of like what else is happening on board the ship that like the the you I, know the, the bridge crew doesn't know about because it's all the lower decks that are if this is you know, something being sneaky if this is something that could <laughs> but only good fun you know. If this is something that cadets are doing on a regular basis, I would suggest that the whole you can't fire a phaser on board is easily circumvented 
Yeah. And you just have to accept that. <laughs> like, clearly there's yeah, a way... I'm not, I'm not saying that yeah. this breaks canon or something or breaks the rules. I'm saying that there's a whole world on the ship that the bridge crew may not be aware of because they're too higher up. Well, it's supposed so to be a really big ship. And the lower decks are, are like, yeah, are, are just... You know, skirting the rules or letting people get away with things and stuff like that. Well, it's a really which big I ship. think is kind of fun. So, so there's, there's going to be like several parts of it that the the bridge crew will never even visit, probably. Yeah. Right. I mean, hell, there's probably decks and decks of just living quarters that, unless you know someone in that particular deck, you're never <laughs> going to go there. Well, yeah, sure. Um, I, I imagine that's true. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense to me. Um. The final big I thing, though, I think, is kind of like a nice little fun bit of lore, <laughs> in a way, you know. Hmm? That just there's a whole other world on the ship that we don't get to see what's going on. I mean, for me, it was more of a character thing. It was just like a way for them to like, because these are the two sort of more, you know, stoic characters who are very like, you know, all about the business. You know, Lan especially. So seeing them actually, and this is the thing, after they do the first few lands, like, you know, I'm not feeling this. Why did they do this? There's nothing, this isn't that fun. Um, and it's not until the last one where they kind of get the, the sort of the rite of passage part of it, which is yeah. they go out to the south side of the ship and they do it with the force field. So we get, it's actually, there was an episode that I just did a TNG recently. There was a Q episode where Q uh, took uh, a younger Q outside the ship and like sort of was just standing in space. And it reminded me of that, but here there's a force field, so obviously, and then because they even say like, "Are we sure this force field is going to hold up?" Because we're standing in space right now. I don't know if this is such a great <laughs> idea, but the whole idea is that there's a, a panel on the sh outside of the ship which has not been replaced. It's the oldest part of the ship that, or the out you know, the outside of the ship. It's the oldest part of the hull that's still there. So people go out and sign their names on it. So they sign their names on it, and it's kind of this like special moment. And they have this beautiful thing where the other, you know, the the, the diplomat alien ship goes past, and it's like this big like sail ship with big golden sails. So it's very spectacular. But uh, you know, th this is the part where he feels like they're they're humbled a little bit, and they understand maybe why the cadets go through this and why it's became a tradition somehow without them ever. Well, knowing. yeah, I think up until that point, they were saying like. You know, the reason this doesn't, we're not getting the same uh, feelings that the cadets do when they do it is because we're the ones that make the rules. So it doesn't mm. matter if we, like, skirt the rules a bit. We do it all the time. But for them, it's a huge deal. And this is the only time where it kind of felt like a huge deal for them. Yeah. So, uh, I, I'll, I will say that even though clearly other people have done this, it's not that many people, because I don't imagine there's that much room in this one panel for, like, hundreds to pe of people to sign it. Clearly, this is, like, a rite of passage that only maybe a few people a year maybe yeah, actually like achieve. It, yeah, um, sure. So, yeah. Uh, but it, it, was, it was one of these things where the show's done a good job of making the characters likable, and this was just, like, a, a good way of... Especially since they've established that these two knew each other before the show started. These two are uh, more acquainted with each other than a lot of the other characters are. So it makes sense that they have this kind of like fun duo chemistry that they're mm -hmm. going to play with. So, uh, And you, you add that on to making Nurse Chapel very likable in this episode and her chemistry with Spock. And like, you know, you're building a lot of... And even Mbenga with his dumb fishing hat. Like, just... Mm -hmm. It's all these little things. They all they all add up. Like, we're only on episode five, but I already feel like I enjoy being around these characters. And I don't think I ever got to that point uh, still with Discovery. Like, you know, like, the main characters are there to move the plot forward, but I, I've never felt in Discovery, like, I'm just happy to be around the crew, like, doing stuff like this. You know? I don't think it was a direct reference, but back to the hat. Um, there's a... Well, you've seen some of the, the show M.A.S.H., where yeah. Colonel Blake always wears a, a fly fishing hat, um, even with his you know uniform, <laughs> the rest of his uniform clean and pressed, he always has a fly fishing hat on. And it just it's one of those things that reminds you of, yeah, I mean, they're all there to be to do their job, to do their duty. But at the same time, like they have personality, they have they need to have fun. And even in that show, like, that's what it reminds you of. Like he's 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 military when he needs to be, but he's also like somebody you can talk to, um, I think. Mbega kind of once you see the fly fishing hat kind of has that same thing all, all of a sudden yeah I, I think obviously when you compare starfleet to military it's a little different and starfleet tends to be a little more uh like they're not there to to oppress 
Yeah, like there's. I mean, I'll, I mean, the mission of this ship, by and large, is to go and discover stuff. You know, it's very mm-hmm. uh, and there's a lot of diplomacy go- going on on it. So uh, the, the the general atmosphere seems to be that of more of a hopeful kind of. Th- generally, obviously, it'll vary ship to ship and whatever. And I'm, sh- I'm sure. You know, I've not started Deep Space Nine yet, but I'm sure that's going to feel a lot more uh, dramatic. You'll get to see more of those golden sails in yeah. Deep Space Nine. Oh, very nice. The solar sails. Uh, but, yeah, so this is a, it's a good plot because it, 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 it's, it's fun and it, it lets these two characters show a different side to their personality because they have... Because La'Anne, especially up until this point, has been a very serious character. And it was just yeah. two episodes ago that Una was worried that she was going to be kicked out of the, the ship and stuff because she's not you know, she's, she's uh, Illyrian. So, mm-hmm. like, it's given these characters the dimensions where the, the even the most serious characters have this more fun side and they have these friendships. And it makes you like them more because they have these characters that can bounce off of each other and you create a, an environment where... Because I would say, by and large, most stories... Like, I, I always see people... You know, one of the, the nerdy questions to ask online is, oh, you know, out of these, like, four shows, like, which one would you want to live in? And... Nine times out of ten, I'm like, I don't want to live in anything. Like, I don't want to live in Breaking Bad. It's horrible. <laughs> like, it's great, but it's horrible. <laughs> I don't want to live in that world. Um, but this made being on the Enterprise seem like a fun time. <laughs> you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Still probably pretty dangerous, but yeah. Danger. Yeah. I mean, I also like the the note of uh, Una's hair looking very sixties, with the ah, twist yeah. though, with a more more uh, retro future look. I'd say. Yeah, the other the plot, the diplomat plot, uh, which it's basically they're just that they want you to like make nice with these aliens because they're uh, right between like Federation and Klingon space, and it would be very strategically sound to have them as allies. So they're trying to speak nice to them. Uh, Pike's rock in the, the the green top, which is a homage to the original show, but I, I always hated when Kirk wore that stupid green top. Like we're the we're the proper one. I don't know why you hate it. It's clearly the best uniform in the show. I love the green uh, oh, wrap no, I tunic thing. It's I was too, super excited to see that it was coming back for this. It was too, I mean, it looks that this one looks better than the original one, but uh... I mean, I don't know why it was in the original. I, I, but it always felt like a special occasion when it came out. I'm so. pre- <laughs> maybe this is complete bullshit, but I seem to remember hearing that it was when Shatner was a little chubbier. This had his weight better. Before he adopted the girdle. But I don't know. He's He always had his shirt off in every season, so he never really got that chubby. <laughs> maybe, maybe an urban myth, but I, I recall hearing that at some uh, point. I mean, it really wasn't in the original series very much, but like I said, it always felt special when it came out. I disagree. <laughs> I don't know what your hate towards it is. <laughs> it's like green. A, it's the best color. Yeah, he's like because it's green. Yeah, it's the best color. It, but also, it's just so unique. You know, it's different. Everything else is I'm the not same against, style. This one's like a wrap. I'm not against a green Star Trek top to match the red, gold, and and blue. But it's a, but it's not though. It's this weird casual looking thing instead. Make it match the others. You can have a green sometimes, top all you want. It's fine. Sometimes Captain's gotta go casual, just like when you know Picard puts his jacket on over the black shirt instead. You know, it always feels special. Ah, right, whatever. I got you there. <laughs> yeah, but his jacket's cool, though. <laughs> so is the green tunic. I disagree. <laughs> and my best Tommy Wiseau voice. I disagree. Um, I wasn't very Tommy Wiseau. I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, so... They're debating, they want to speak to Spock, it's actually to bring in Spock's body for most of it. Um, it, it all comes down to Pike basically playing a hunch, because uh, they notice that when they're talking to Spock, they get more logical, but when they're talking to him, you know, they act a bit more well like him. Um, and he suspects that, I mean, obviously the Admiral's like, well, doesn't that mean they sort of match whoever they're talking to? And he's like... Well, but what if uh, they, they kind of respect the candor? They respect that someone just sort of, like, understands their point of view. Because uh, that's what they're, they're... They're constantly trying to, like, emulate our point of view by sort of... Not... Copying is not the right word, but emulating whoever, what type of person they're speaking to. So what yeah. if what they're going to respect is if we emulate them 
and just give them what we think they're thinking. And sure enough, yeah. he says, well, here's all the reasons why it's not like the best deal for you. You know, you this might put you in danger being aligned with us. And, you know, obviously we have a lot of strategical reasons for wanting to be allied with you, but it's mostly because of where you are in space. It's because of where you are between us and the Klingons. Because it'd be bad for us for you to align yourself with the Klingons or the Romulans because blah, blah, blah. And he, you know, he lists off all these things. And the Admiral's like, you know, shitting a brick because he's like, what are you doing, Pike? What are you doing? You're ruining this. Uh, but... His hunch is right because they put up the Federation flag on their ship as they fly off. Uh, mm-hmm. So obviously this intercuts with the uh, the stuff with uh, Una and Laan on the outside of the ship. Yeah, it was neat. I enjoyed the you know when you first see the aliens is through the view screen and they're showing a uh, a clip of when they were talking to the Tellarites, which are an alien race that are known for being very antagonistic, and that's just part of their culture. They they like it when people argue with them. So, like, you see them fighting and stuff, and it's like, oh, well, they don't get along with the Tellarites. But really, they're just doing the emulation thing in order to empathize, because eventually, I'm not sure which one of the two uh, delegates say, uh, you know, empathy is very important to us. Just understanding um, cultures and stuff. And um, I think... Uh, it seems to be that they're mimicking cultures for a while or whoever they're talking to just as a, I don't know, just some cutesy little trait thing that this alien species does, but it, there is a purpose for it. Like they are trying to understand the Federation and, every, and all of its members that are available to them there, which is, you know, the humans and Vulcans. Yeah. It's just over there speaking to, they try to emulate how they think as a way of trying to understand them. So, the, you know, and Pike figures that out and just sort of... Yeah. Saves the day again. Yeah. Do I yep. d- detect a little passive aggressiveness in your voice there? No. I still don't like Pike, but, like, I like the show okay. a lot. It's okay. another really good episode. Yeah, it was, it was good. I, I don't know if I like it as much as the last two episodes, because the last two were, like, had a lot of great stuff in them. The last two were pretty heavy. This one was definitely very light and fun. But I, I appreciate it from a pacing perspective. Like, I think having this episode after last week's intense, you know, the Gorn are going to kill us all episode, I think it's really mm-hmm. smart sequencing as far as watching it as the season goes. So I think some thought went into that. And I, that, yeah. I, I appreciate that. So Yeah, totally. Uh, so that's good. Um, yeah. Uh, Another, I mean, this, uh another good one it's doing a good job of making me like all the characters and still feeling star trekky without um overdoing certain elements i yeah it was really good and there's a good trek show and i don't know how to take it it's weird it's lots of good trek shows well modern trek i mean obviously i mean it's easy to watch the next gen and be like oh this was great and did all these great things (laughs) <laughs> I am still watching um, Picard season two with my friend, and we just got to the two, the two back to back episodes of singing in the club, and then, oh. <laughs> and then uh, what was the one after that was the, uh, oh, the dream sequence one where Picard's like in his fantasy coma. Is that also the uh, one where uh, she's eating the the car battery? <laughs> no, I think that's the next one. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, even my friend is just like, "What the hell is this? <laughs> what happened?" That, that's where, because yeah, because the episode before that, like, uh, when it sets up the sort of heist that the the ball, it's like, "Oh, that sounds like a fun idea." Yeah. And then it's probably yeah. that next episode where they're actually at the ball and this, the the song happens. Where you're like, "This is going in a bit of a direction now. <laughs> what, what, what is this doing?" And then yeah. f- from there it just gets worse, sadly. So yeah, it, uh, yeah, I'll admit it's nice to have strange new worlds. <laughs> I'm so glad it's good. Uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, we disagree on Discovery. Oh, to be fair, season four didn't shit the bed like I thought it was going to. Uh, but I still like Discovery. Yeah. But uh, which it, is why it, I didn't, I didn't it, uh, reply to your shitting all over Discovery earlier in this discussion. <laughs> Instead, change the subject. I don't remember what I said about Discovery, but okay. Okay. <laughs> I will continue. That will continue to be my strategy. <laughs> I mean, I think Discovery is full of problems, but uh, like, uh, it's amazing just how much this sticking to fundamentals. But it's still, and that's the thing. It's not. It's not just nothing but homage, though. It's actually, 
building and making me like the characters so that i'm mm-hmm. enjoying the adventures they're going on and it giving this new personality to some of them and um you know taking the gorn and making them into these big villains like i, I like i'm having a great time like I, this is like it's the it's the perfect mix of like i oh, wanting to feel like old star trek but also having the slick production values uh it's of, great. of modern yeah. trek um, i'm really impressed with this show so far I can't just say how weird it is that uh, these modern Trek shows are looking so much better than modern Star Wars. Because uh, I, you know, I, I did the pilot for Obi Wan, and like these, are, these feel more expensive. Like these, these feel way more expensive oh, yeah. than the Star Wars shows. And I would not have predicted like, if you like. I'm not even talking about quality here. I mean, I, I didn't like the Obi Wan pilot, but for ignoring quality here of the the writing and stuff, I'm just talking about the, like how expensive they look. If you when when all this stuff was announced, well, even, few, yeah, few, even Discovery season one, like that pilot episode was just like, wow, they're really putting yeah. a lot of money into this. When they were announcing all these Star Wars shows over the last couple of years, if you had told me that like there was going to be a clear disparity where all the Trek shows were going to look better, like with better effects, higher production values, and out outshine what Star Wars, I'd be like, are you crazy? Why, why why would that happen? It's Disney, and like Star Wars but is also, this huge thing. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm like. I mean, I'll take it. I'm not going to complain. Um, so yeah, but uh, yep. good episode. So pretty good. Uh, Looking forward to next week. Yeah, there you go. That is uh. Do you know what? See on the old show, uh, the old show on the on, on next gen uh, original series that they with Connor. I always look ahead and read the IMDb description for the next one. Given that this is very episodic, should we do that at the end of these? If, sure. if, if it's there i don't know what's coming up next i, I don't know if imdb will have a description for the next one they may not have it because it's not aired yet um no. by the time we do our reviews there's usually like a trailer i think out for the next one but i i don't, I don't usually watch, watch them tra- yeah i don't watch a trailer uh no it says add a plot it's not it's not there if it was going to be there i would have said oh we'll get a little little sentence to tease what the next episode is uh Dang. i'll tell you what the title is though if you want to just sure. uh let your mind go nuts with the title uh the next episode is called lift us where suffering cannot reach Oh, sounds deep. Sounds like a heavy episode. <laughs> it does like a heavy episode. Hope you had fun. <laughs> yeah. Hope you enjoyed this breather, because next time it's going to be misery and pain and death. <laughs> but yes. Good. Or it's probably going to be hopeful. I'm sure it'll be hopeful by the end, but I suspect there'll be some, uh, like, we all may die before the hope kicks in. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, so there you go. That is uh, Spock Amok. Uh Season one, episode five of Strange New Worlds. So let us know what you thought of this episode in the comments below. Like, subscribe, ding the bell for notifications, all that stuff. Get us on the Twitters at mail underscore fudge for child updates. If you want to support the show with some money, you can do that a couple of different ways. You can hit the super thanks button on YouTube, or you can go to patreon.com slash mail fuzz TV and support us as little as dollar yeah, for as little as one dollar per month and get some bonuses for your trouble and help keep all the content coming. But otherwise, that is us. So thank you once again. That's so easy, huh? I've literally done it perfectly (laughs) thousands of times. But yeah, yes. Enjoy the the one flub out of a thousand that you just witnessed. (laughs) I will. I love that some people who probably came out of these Star Trek reviews but haven't seen anything where you do the <laughs> Patreon plug and this is just out of the blue that you're enjoying this so much. Well, they should know that I am perfect delivery 100% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all they need to know. That's uh, true. All right. That is us. Thank you once again for watching and listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching Star Trek and remember to explore weird strangely no remember to explore weird fresh planets